I um, had, while I was studying in Boston, I was working on my doctorate, been told any number of times that I ought to look up somebody whose name was Mary Boys, who was teaching at Boston College while I was at Boston University. And I never did that. At one of the first public events that I went to at um, JTS, I'll say JTS, but I mean Jewish Theological Seminary, um, there were people invited from the neighborhood. And um, one of the neighboring uh, uh, institutions is uh, Union Theological Seminary. And somebody introduced me to this phantom, Mary Boys. And we found out that we had a lot in common. And um, she asked if I wanted to teach with her a course in uh, the religious uh, education of adults using spiritual autobiographies. And I thought, okay, that's literature. I think I can fake it enough to make my way through those texts. And I have become very interested in interreligious dialogue ever since. So that was about, I would guess, about uh, 15 years ago. Um, and we teach this course in um, religious, the, the religious education of adults every other year. Um, you may have just answered this question, um, but uh, is there an experience in interfaith dialogue, uh, either with another person or tradition, that uh, has impacted the way that you view, think, or act in the world? Well, I think this experience with Mary has been an eye-opener for me. And in the same way, the colloquy was an eye-opener for me. That's the scandal of particularity? Yeah, the scandal of particularity, because um, I found that I was very comfortable with a Catholic dialogue partner. Um, we had um, a lot of shared views about ritual, uh, about um, prayer, um, about um, a tradition that is um, very long and complicated for each of us. And that was very comfortable. For me, involving myself in the scandal of particularity was one that opened me up um, to all sorts of experiences with people of various Protestant denominations, and that was new to me. Mm -hmm. And how did you find that to be as a new experience? Well, um, I, I found there were people who took the Bible text incredibly seriously and were just so knowledgeable uh, that that was um, something that um, I found incredibly impressive and, and in the same way very familiar to me Jewishly. It was a little different than studying with um, uh, a Catholic um, uh, and uh, people whose knowledge of Hebrew was incredibly um, impressive one of the most meaningful experiences for me in the scandal was studying with a, a Lutheran professor of Hebrew and Bible and uh, seeing her eyes light up when she was reading in Hebrew and translating a psalm. And that was a wow experience for me. Um. Are there ways that you've been transformed by your experiences in interfaith dialogue? I think I'm more sensitive to um, the issues that uh, Christians don't get about Jews. Mm -hmm. um, how one could call oneself a Jew and not believe in God. Um, it's not, we Jews meet Jews like that all the time. Right. And we don't necessarily have that expectation. Because for many Jews, being Jewish is something that's ethnic. It's about peoplehood. And um, I am aware 
for the fact that that is a very hard concept for Christians to wrap their heads around. I'm also aware of the fact that Christians, um, many of them, um, have um, uh, along the lines of ethnicity, this question about ethnicity, don't really understand how important Israel is to the Jewish people, the land of Israel. Mm -hmm. um, um, I am um, impressed with how many Christians are trying to deal with the issue of supersessionism in their in their texts in their ritual practices, and um, I think that we Jews. Uh, also need to look at ourselves carefully and the way we teach about um, Christianity, if we teach about Christianity at all in our environments. Excellent. And I understand that you've brought a, uh, a ritual item to share with us today. Um, <laughs> and if you wouldn't mind, I'd love to hear a little bit about it. Okay. Um, Hold, I brought. Feel free to hold it up. There, okay, so you can I'll see hold it, it up. Um, I brought what it looks like a very cheesy leatherette um, bound uh, volume of the Holy Scriptures, the Hebrew Bible, and um, it's important to me on a number of levels. Uh, one is um, it was. Um, a gift that I was given by my congregation when I was about 11 or 12 years old when I graduated from the community uh, Hebrew school that I went to and I was one of the kids who actually loved going um, which just corroborates my children's impressions that I was probably the nerd among yeah. nerds um, of my generation, but um, I was fortunate enough to have a wonderful, lively, uh, pedagogically trained teachers who actually made religious school more, much more appealing to me than the rather rigid, ossified uh, Boston public school I was going to at that time. So um, it. It symbolizes my beginnings um, of uh, the a long, lifelong encounter with Jewish texts. Um, it doesn't necessarily symbolize those Jewish texts so much. This is an English translation. And um, it's not the book that I would pick up um, when I want to study something in the Bible. I would really study it in Hebrew, a language that I learned at the school, but for whatever reasons, the book they gave us was this book in English. So it, it, it has echoes of a journey, a lifelong journey in Jewish education Excellent. for me. But it also um, has um, the evocative um, uh, quality of reminding me of um, my wedding. I chose to, because I thought it was very glamorous and I was sort of getting away from that bridal bouquet business. I chose to take this book, which was then white instead of yellow as <laughs> it is now, and I had it covered with a few flowers. It was probably financially more um, uh, sensible uh, so part of it may have been done by, out of uh, financial exigency, but I think I thought it was kind of glamorous. But then there was that piece about, um, I could have chosen any little white volume. So there was something about embarking on a Jewish journey with um, a man that I would be married to for 43 years, so that this little book was part of that journey as well. 